welcome. What kind of influence does our faith have on the literature of the border? Does the border region have a unique style of literature, one that was influenced by the unusual chemistry of the confluence of several religious and spiritual traditions? Well, Brandon Schuler, a, a, an instructor at Texas Tech University, has been grappling with that very question. So we welcome today, Brandon. So nice to have you. Thanks for having me here, Holly. I'm, yeah. I'm honored. Great. Well. Um, have religious and spiritual traditions actually affected the literature and the writing of the border very a much? Absolutely. When you look at uh, border writing, especially from Brown, if we look at Texas border writing from mm -hmm. Brownsville to El Paso, you see a confluence of basically three different religions or beliefs coming in together at the same place. Mm -hmm. And that is Anglo beliefs that come in, uh, the Hispanic, Spanish Catholicism that comes mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And then you also have your indigenous beliefs that right. were here from the people, the Aztecs and the Mayans that were here before. Mm -hmm. uh, all three of those together have shaped a very unique border mm -hmm. belief and literature mm -hmm. uh, that's very rich, mm -hmm. but also shows at the same time that it, it reflects what a young literature is. And mm -hmm. when you look at border literature, and especially literatures of the Southwest as a uh, young literature, you know, 1500s when Coronado came here, this is right. what you could really consider the first literatures. Which is, as you contrast that to English literature, for example, which is... 800s, yeah. the birth of that, right. you know. Yeah. We're all an extension of basically Greek literature, mm -hmm. you know, the, in the BCs, but in the grand scheme of things, we are very, very young literature. Yeah. So that, that's got to be kind of fascinating to to be experiencing kind of a, an emerging literary form that reflects primarily three different cultures as you're as you're talking about there or maybe even more I don't know uh, you know yes there is more because uh, you take all three of these and you combine them mm -hmm. and it's uh, what we call in literature studies hybridization uh, you get this hybridized literature that is an amalgamation of all three mm -hmm. that creates something completely new. Uh, one of the foremost Latina scholars, Gloria Ansadula, in the borderlands for the frontera, she really looks at that and looks at the different voices that, you know, English may have been at the time a colonial, col colonizing voice that the peoples of this area wanted to use to communicate. But at the same time, they had another colonizing voice in Spanish mm -hmm. that very much affected their their speaking capacity, and when I say speaking capacity, I'm talking in the written word. And what they were trying to do was get out in their beliefs, in their indigenous Indian beliefs, mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with these two languages that they're expressing themselves in. Mm -hmm. So it creates this entire fourth new space mm -hmm. that is beauty, mm -hmm. it is beautiful, and it leaves a rich, rich history and cultural perspective of something that us literature studies folks like to look right, at. Yeah. Now, can you give us an example of what that might look like? Would it be a story uh, that would come to mind? Uh, really, all border literatures follow that from the earliest point. You look at Coronado and even uh, looking at the narrative that they came across this land, they tried to write about what they were seeing, mm -hmm. but they're writing about corn and tomatoes, stuff that they don't have in the new world, in the old world, that mm -hmm. they have in the new world. So mm -hmm. you see the first genesis of this changing literature and the birth of this literature is they're trying to find words to express what they're trying to say. Uh, and as you move forward, Willa Cather, Death Comes to the Archbishop, has written about this whole area and it's mm -hmm. about the missionaries coming in and working with the Pueblo Indians and trying to write a narrative that they could send back to Rome and to mm -hmm. the to the Pope and to the bishops back in Rome that would capture what they were trying to do here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it created unique literature and unique words and a unique perspective on a part of the world mm -hmm. that no one else has mm -hmm. because this is a dry country. But as Tom Lee says, it's a wonderful country. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful and it's trying to capture uh, the nature of this place in words that it's hard to catch capture the mm -hmm. Southwest in words. Right. Well, certainly most most of Europe would have experienced nothing like the Southwest, I would think, in, in terms of uh, what Europe looks like. 
Oh, absolutely. You know? I mean, this arid, dry, gray, mm -hmm. dusty land, and mm -hmm. you know, they're over here to find the seven cities of Sibylla and try to find, find, uh, find riches beyond what man can imagine. And as they were doing that, they were coming up against the resistance from the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. But what they did was would use the church as a way, as another form of, I hate to use the church in spiritual matters as a form of colonization, but mm -hmm. what they tried to do is, you know, win the hearts mm -hmm. and then the minds would follow. Right. And that's what really they would try to do. And it was interesting the way that the Southwest is colonized from the Catholic point of view, because in the sense of the Anglo colonization, it was done by force, mm -hmm. where there's a unique beauty in the faith and love that a monk or a friar would have to grab a donkey, like in Willa Cather's Death for the Archbishop, and just strike out into this scary mm -hmm. land where everything has has thorns, mm -hmm. everything has teeth, everything bites you. Uh, the natives don't necessarily want you there. Mm -hmm. There's a beauty in that faith that just uh, always leaves me in awe. Mm -hmm that these guys would leave the confines of a sh safe mission to go set up other missions mm -hmm. in the face of the greatest adversity that they could possibly have. And a lot of these guys were just trained in Rome mm -hmm. and were coming over here. And it goes back to their European sensibility. They had never seen anything like this. Mm -hmm. And they're striking out into this arid land with nothing but faith alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, that is pretty dramatic. and. Uh, in terms of, of how they wrote about their experiences, um, did they incorporate any of the uh, a description of the indigenous beliefs or how the Indians were responding to the faith at all? Or, or how did they deal with those issues when they were reporting back? Uh, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's a book question. That's a, <laughs> that's a book thesis. Uh, and it's really interesting the way that they did this, because you look at manuscript culture, and you know, this was pre-printing press. The first printing press didn't make it until the Southwest until late, late in the 1800s. So almost everything that you have coming out of the Southwest was manuscript in the form mm. of letters written back and forth. Uh, and you capture these manuscripts, and you start to capture the story of the indigenous people. And this is where you know, some scholars have a hard time with this. Gloria Spivak, she's a huge post-colonial scholar. She looks and says, does the subaltern have a voice? And the subaltern is being the person, in this case, the Indians that are trying to speak, but their language isn't codified. It's not written down in a sense that we could send it back to Europe and people could read it and understand it. Uh, so there's been some argument is, are these stories that are being shared from the point of view, from the friar, the monk, the person mm -hmm. that's coming out to colonize it, are these fair representations? And I think the best way to go back to there is look at J. Frank Doby. Uh, he's the father of Southwestern scholars, was active from the 1920s to the 1960s. And he has typically been looked down upon because he's coming in and he's taking what they would call at that time the Mexican stories. But what we have to kind of expand now, knowing a little more about Doby, that he was looking at the indigenous stories and finding a voice to tell these things. And what he is doing was he was capturing the true essence of what was going on mm -hmm. at this time and telling these stories, but telling them in a way that may not necessarily fit savvily with the intent of the story, but which also makes that story beautiful. And Dobie realized that he really wished he could get an indigenous 100% Spanish speaker to tell these stories. And he tried it. Dobie has been in the past labeled a racist, other things, uh, but he really wasn't. Javita Gonzalez, she's from the lower Rio Grande Valley, graduated University of Texas with a master's in 1924. Uh, first Mexican American female to get a master's from University of Texas. Mm. And she was a folklorist. She was president of the Texas Folklore Society, mm. and she was one of the first, along with Medico Paredes, that were trying to get these stories in the natural tongue mm -hmm. onto paper. So what would be an example of the kind of story that they might tell? What, what would that be like? So the one that I always like to use with my students, and uh, 
it's interesting to say this, my students are working on a paper right now. I make them do autoethnography, where kind of take me as a young Dobie voice. I'm going, I work with my students, uh, especially when I was teaching at University of Texas Pan America in McAllen. A lot of these stories haven't been told. Mm -hmm. So I would get these folks to write their story, interview grandparents, get mm -hmm. their stories, oh, okay. and get these stories on paper. And the story I always use with those guys is the uh, La Llorona story. You know, Sandra Cisneros calls it the woman at Hollering Creek. Uh, La Llorona in South Texas. Here, I've heard it, the Hollering Creek and La Llorona. But then that same voice, that same person, the same avatar, I guess, is the same one that shows up in The Wild Woman and the Navidad, which is written on the Nueces River, but it's written from the Anglo's point of view. Hmm. And what I try to do is find stories that are stories that run in our blood. Mm -hmm. And most folks around that will be watching this will understand what Lerona is, but that's the one. She lost her baby, and she's walking along a creek bed, depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. And she's wailing because she's trying to find this baby. Some stories, she's killed the baby. Other stories, the baby's been kidnapped by Indians. The others, it's been... And that's what I try to do is try to find out what are the complexities and nuances of these stories that each cultural group adapts them and uses them for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of border literatures because, you know, Mexico side is going to have an idea for the story and use it for their own moral ends. Mm -hmm. The Anglos are going to use it for their own moral ends. Mm -hmm. And then the Indians, Native Americans, actually had a story that roughly goes along mm. through this, that they use it for their own moral ends. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the beauty of these stories and these, uh, these uh, border literatures that bring those all together. Yeah. Now, uh, is it, are most of these the oral tradition and then finally written down? Is that, that how it works? For the so, most part? yes, when you look at a new literature, and that's what we're going to call a border literature, is it, we are a new literature. 1500 to 2000, that's 500 years. It's a very short time frame. With that said, technology and education, right. it's much quicker. Uh, but yes, that's what you see at the birth of all literatures, is it's an oral tradition mm -hmm. that finds its way to paper. Right. And how that oral tradition, unfortunately, a lot is lost in taking the oral tradition to paper. Mm -hmm. But what makes the border so unique and so beautiful is the grito, is you have these stories and songs hmm. that are still there that carry on that oral tradition. Hmm. So you see it in both, both ways, hmm. but that oral tradition is, and you still see that with older men on the, on, on the river that still love to share those stories and still tell those stories. And there's a rhythm and a flow like you get from the river that is reflected in language that you just can't get in paper because once it's left your pen onto your paper, it's the reader then adapts the flow right. and rhythm of that and so you lose some of that. Right. So um, what, what kind of impact do you think that the missionaries made in terms of, of their faith and transmitting this faith in reaching the heart of the indigenous people. Uh, how did that work? So they would see the beauty in these stories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have horrific stories mm -hmm. on the friars and monks that came into the point. I mean, for the most part, Native Americans in the Southwest in the beginning were fair weather. Christians mm -hmm. and Catholics in yeah. the sense that yeah. the missionary was ours when we needed it and then yeah. we didn't. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes the monks were fair weather spiritual advisors. You right. know, they would chop off feet to keep people in one place mm. to mm. build the mission. You know, that's, that's horrible. Yeah. But then you had the completely altruistic missions that were here to really help the people. And whenever you start to get that, Willa Cather, I keep going back to the death of the Archbishop, but it's the most elegant story that we have in Southwestern literature that really looks like as the monks are colonizing, and I hate using that word, but as they're using their mission and spreading the word, they are changing fundamentally the beliefs of the indigenous people because the indigenous people 
would buy into the beliefs of the monks. And I use that buy-in as in they are changing their faith belief to see mm -hmm. the uh, see the true way. But as they did this, there's something else uniquely happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's not just the indigenous people that are changing. Mm -hmm. The monks are changing as well because they're hearing the Native American folk stories and mm -hmm. the Native American. And when I say American, I don't mean America, U.S. I mean American right. continent. Right. Uh, those indigenous beliefs and those Native American beliefs are bleeding into their beliefs as well. Mm -hmm. So you start to see this hybridized faith and belief. Mm -hmm. So you may see a typical Christian parable mm -hmm. that begins to take on elements of Native American mm -hmm. parables. Right. And it become, it, that, that's what makes us so beautiful. And mm -hmm. you see the Indians really adapting into that mm -hmm. and really shaping a a belief system that is the best of both mm -hmm. worlds. You know, you have the Native Americans that are really driven by a nature-based faith. Everything comes from nature. Mm -hmm. Kind of an animistic, would you say? Yeah, yeah. I right. would. And then uh, you see that in Southwest Catholicism. You right. see a lot of nature with a big N right. as a part of that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's beauty, the, the Virgin of Guadalupe. I mean, right. That's all strictly from nature. And mm -hmm. she has a very natural, with the big N, mm -hmm. aura about her mm -hmm. and fits into that. So what you saw then in the, in the spirituality was, was definitely a mutual influence. Would you, would you go so far as to call it syncretism where, um, where, uh, missionaries were consciously uh, adapting Native American beliefs and then um, uh, sort of modifying them around to correspond with Christianity. Absolutely, um, and I think, and please help me with my Spanish on this one, I always trip over this word. You see this best in the Cunadera, mm -hmm. um, the, the faith healer. Mm -hmm. uh, the monks, really saw this to their benefit to use this spiritual healer, mm -hmm. Native American spiritual healer. So they would start to adapt some of their stories and use herbs and stuff. And they saw how this worked. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they would kind of shift the narrative a little bit from mm -hmm. the big father of the earth gave us mm -hmm. this, the hill from the Native American sons, and would take it and say, well, this came from our big father and our God, he gave us these things and created this all around us to mm -hmm. do this. So there were some parallels of what they were looking for. They were both coming to the same place mm -hmm. from different ends. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not hard to believe, and I, I, I think I believe this. The God, the big father that the Native Americans were praying to mm -hmm. is that interconnected oneness that all the three major faiths mm -hmm. believe in, you know, Allah. Mm -hmm. Yahweh and God is the same God is the mm -hmm. same big omnipotent being mm -hmm. they just didn't have the words that mm -hmm. they used in Europe in the old world right yeah well you know and I think that's probably where we would you know I mean I think it's it's a matter of you know where you're coming from in terms of your faith tradition because I think the the missionaries would uh, you know, definitely be trying to get the Indians to understand the Christian tradition and the Christian concept of God the Father, uh, and the whole concept of of Allah and all that wouldn't wouldn't have occurred, I don't think, to any of them at that point. But certainly, um, uh, I think that the concept of of piggybacking or building on the remnants of faith and spirituality that are already there uh, to help them to, to bridge that understanding. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, missionaries do that all over the world, have done that all over the world. Um, and um, I know there, there's a book called He Put Eternity in Their Hearts, where uh, the, he, the, a particular missionary talks about how uh, the, the remnants or the seeds of faith have been in, put in the hearts of every individual, every civilization, every gr people group on earth. And the question is how those will evolve, how those will be called forth. 
and uh, and and I, I think that's the challenge um, is at what point are you crossing the line and compromising the beliefs uh, you know in the purity of the faith and at what point are you trying to build a bridge of understanding and I don't think that's an easy line to discern at all times you know and it probably would vary from you know whoever's looking at the the issue so that whole issue of syncretism is uh, you know a, a, basically a controversial one you know right. uh, very definitely um, so what are the major themes and threads that we see in in um, this type of literature well, you you mentioned you know the the mo mother with the lost child uh, you know what do I do? Where you know? What kind of themes do we we find kind of reoccurring over and over again in this new genre of literature? In border literature, and this is a identity is a huge theme, mm -hmm. uh, and it's more so of a point of contention, I guess, in lower border issues in South Texas, uh, and. I have very strong beliefs in this, and it actually happened, I started kind of forming this thesis about this at the Doubletree Hotel a couple years ago, mm -hmm. as I was standing up there and looking across the river in Juarez. And I'll get back to the identity thing, but in South Texas literature along the border, you see a lot of friction hmm. between the two. Uh, between the between, between the Anglo and, and Mexican, okay. and okay. you see a lot of friction, you know, in our revolution down there, in 1912 to 1950, with uh, Juan Cortina was much different than that. That was a struggle for land rights, mm -hmm. really, uh, and you had Cortina battling against feeling like we were having. The Hispanic population was having their land stolen from them. Mm -hmm. uh, you had revolution occurring at the same time here, but that was more of an internal struggle with uh, Via and those folks. And you had where you get the bad Texas Ranger happens in the 1912 to 1915 revolution in South Texas because there was a group of South Texas Rangers that were called Special Rangers. They actually weren't rangers. They were just basically deputized mercenaries that mm. came along. Uh, and there were depredations on both sides. Mm -hmm. I mean, Anglos killed a bunch of Mexican nationals that were living on this side mm -hmm. uh, in the wrong way, for, for wrong reasons, just innocent folks. Okay. Then at the same time down there, you also had Juan Catina and his guys, Cordonistas, coming across raiding ranches and yeah, killing right, right. folks. So, I mean, yeah. it was really misunderstood. But if you look at the landscapes between here and there, in South Texas, it's flat. Mm -hmm. You don't see your neighbor. Whereas I kind of started to build this thesis of why upper border issues are a little different, identity issues are a little different. If you stand on Mount Franklin and the way El Paso is built, and you look at the way Juarez is built, you see each other each day. Mm -hmm. You're conscious yeah. of each other's oh, day. Absolutely, yeah. And survival here was man against nature. Mm -hmm. And by God, we've got to connect with each other to survive here. Mm -hmm. And identity is the biggest running theme. Am I Mexican? Am I Anglo? Am I a border citizen? What am I? Mm -hmm. And I think the best one. Uh, since October is celebrating Tom Lee month, Tom Lee's The Wonderful Country is the best example from the Anglo point of view because the protagonist, Martin, Martin Brady, mm -hmm. is either Martin Brady, mm -hmm. if he's on the American side, mm -hmm. or he's Martine Brady, if he's on the other side. Mm -hmm. So he uses that identity mm. to work in both worlds. Mm -hmm. And I think you still see that theme. Uh, Paul, Pedro pa Paul Pedroza mm -hmm. is a... Uh, very prominent El Paso up-and-coming creative writer. Uh, you have Sergio Choncoso, Rich Inez. Uh, all these guys really explore identity, and their identity is usually predicated on their faith that is built from here, mm -hmm. that those themes tie in uniquely in a way that 
raises a lot of questions, but raises a lot of questions about identity in a very eloquent, very internal way mm -hmm. that looks at the entire connectedness of all men under one God trying right. to figure out who they are and where do they fit into this right. space. Right. Well, uh, and what do you think about Bless Me Ultima? That's been uh, a very recent, recently made into a movie and has been getting a lot of play here. Does that, would you say that that was uh, uh, a similar piece of, of border literature that reflected that same struggle for identity? It does, and it raises some interesting ones. Uh, so the 1940s to the 1960s, and Rudolfo and I, uh, it, this is set in the 1940s. The protagonist is four brothers, are off at war. They come back, and it's very pertinent to what goes on in the uh, on, on border regions because, especially in a situation like that, because you have the brothers go off to war. Mm -hmm. Any service member is a hero in my eyes. And they come back and as they're in war and with their brothers of war, they're included as equals. Mm -hmm. But then they come back, mm -hmm. they're second class citizens again. Right. And it become, and you don't see that as much here in the literatures as folks addressing that as you do in South Texas. South Texas literature, I keep going back there because it's the friction. Uh, but Anaya's Bless Me Ultima really looks at that sense of identity that they move in and out of this, I belong, I don't belong, mm -hmm. I belong, I don't belong. Mm -hmm. And I think we still see that. Yeah, and, and ultimately, isn't that the question we all have? Am I, uh, do I belong, don't I belong to God? <laughs> and uh, Brandon, we have run out of time. It's been delightful to talk with you and we so appreciate the time and energy that you've dedicated to Texas and Southwest literature in a unique way. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Yes. Uh, it's important to understand what kind of influence our faith is having on the border culture, especially the literature, poetry, and the transmission of values. The question is, what values are being transmitted? Well, we need to pray that even more gifted Christian writers will emerge and contribute to this unique genre of writing. Thank you for watching.